this week's crypto recap. What is driving this latest market correction? We'll get into all this and more in this week's weekly recap, actionable insights and a breakdown into everything you need to know all in under 30 minutes. Nick, it's a sea of red out there. Maybe just give us a bit of an update on, on how bad the situation is. Uh, yes, yeah, so as if you've been living under a rock, you might have realized that, oh wow, crypto markets have absolutely plummeted. We saw Bitcoin down 20% in the last seven days, ETH down a massive 30%, Solana 32%, and overall the total crypto market cap is down around 15, I think heading on to 17%. So it's the biggest 3D, three-day wipeout in crypto for I think over 12, probably going on now um, 20 months maybe. Uh, we saw about 300 million worth of liquidations within an hour or something like some crazy numbers that we haven't quite seen for you know since really the may terror crash in 2022 so bitcoin slid below 60k and the global stock market is down across the board from the us to japan and that's probably what we'll get into first matt and understanding exactly what's driving this latest correction yeah so like any a market move, whether it's a rally or a crash, you know, everyone always is wanting to know the reasons behind you know price movements, and I think everyone always wants a simple one reason. But as with everything, it's multifaceted. There's yeah a few contenders here for being a real, I suppose, major factor in, in this latest sell off. Uh, we'll we'll go through some of them uh, in in the coming minutes here. But yeah, the big thing again, every, it's a macro meltdown. They're sort of calling it. There's yeah, stock market, yeah, in in sort of plummeting, uh, crypto plummeting, and and many other sort of risk assets also taking a hit. So the big reason I think today in particular, so Monday the fifth of August, is is just turmoil going on in Japan. With uh, I think we saw recently the central bank announced a rate hike from zero to 0 0.25 i think it was that surprised the market and led to their currency which had been plummeting for for many many years and a lot of people attributed some stock market health uh for that that weaker currency because people were doing what's called a carry trade but we don't need to get into the details but i think a lot of re people saw that weak japanese currency and would attribute the really healthy stock market we've been seeing as, as that as being one small reason. So when they, I guess, increased rates, uh, that sort of, again, nullified that carry trade or made it less appealing. And therefore, we're seeing stocks really sell off and, and the Japanese currency really rallying uh, and strengthening, which it has not done in a very long time. So, yeah, we're seeing now like reactions to that sort of surprising news happening with people, you know, questioning the stability of the Japanese banking system um, and also just the health of their financial markets in particular. And I suppose the reasons behind all that, you know, we're not, that's not our bread and butter, but we know enough to, we know enough to know that a lot of people are sort of seem to be freaking out. Um, and there's just, I suppose the real takeaway for, for us and, you know, you listening is to really just understand that there's a lot of uncertainty particularly in in the japanese market at the moment and i think people forget it is the the fourth largest economy so yeah definitely relevant and any big shocking news would understandably sort of shake global markets so i think maybe even some numbers are you know quite handy here you saw i think 20 percent of one of japanese biggest banks you know was down quite considerably people are will make the analogy to like a JP Morgan in Japan. So we think, you know, biggest banks in Japan really struggle and trade like that's something we'll see in the altcoin market, man, and, mm. and Bitcoin and Ethereum and cryptocurrency, not, you know, big sound banks in Japan. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, it just highlights sort of the, yeah, the uncertainty at the moment uh, happening in Japan. So worth, worth keeping an eye on and um i think another big reason so that that's probably one that's very topical again monday 5th of august uh probably the biggest reason for this crash uh i think in the last sort of week is is the just recessionary fears sort of increasing in, in the us uh so why yeah why did that happen well there were two releases of data on friday a weak jobs report and also just a weak sort of manufacturing survey and whatnot uh, that added to this narrative that maybe the Federal Reserve, so the central bank has has poorly, has not executed in their sort of goal of, of having a softer landing. So for those just out of the loop, what were they trying to do in COVID? They wanted to really 
reaction to COVID, they aggressively like hiked rates uh, to sort of slow down like inflation and, and to try to you know tamper uh, and bring inflation back down to historic levels because if you have high inflation for so long, it's really bad for a number of reasons. Um, they seemingly achieved their goal of getting inflation back down to historically sort of favorable levels of between two and three percent. It's not quite there yet, but it's coming down very close. Um, and their goal of achieving a soft landing was the sense that, hey, let's bring inflation back under control, but still have the US economy doing well, all things considered, um, and avoiding a recession. But yeah, over the over the weekend, there's been really heightened fears uh, of a recession. I think Goldman Sachs came out and increased their probability from 15% to 25% of a recession. Um, and I suppose when people are getting so excited i suppose or investors getting excited about rate cuts uh that has more so been under the assumption that the central bank is going to be cutting rates not to try to like really stimulate the economy and you know into a recessionary period but people were more so just hoping they were cutting rates because hey they were just bringing them back down because they'd been hiking so much um, but if they are going to start cutting rates because they're trying to avoid a recession that is, you know, when you go back over the numbers and data, there's sort of two sort of cuts or two sort of types of cuts that the central bank can do uh, for reasons why they would cut. And I suppose the reason for cutting into a recession or to avoid a recession, there really doesn't seem to be that great of a stock market performance historically when they are doing that. So that's a big reason, I think, why we've seen macro really having a meltdown as well over the weekend but there's some other reasons but plus the japanese stuff of course i think it's hard to go past that it's not just the japanese stock market but the u.s stock market at the moment there's something a figure of like 500 billion worth of market cap that was erased from the so-called magnificent seven so these big stocks and we even saw like uh, industry sale what's that people look to like warren buffett mm. you know sold considerable portion of their apple holdings that they've had for decades and increased their cash position which is another soft hit there of you know, the real concern in the market at the moment. Yeah, I think they've been, um, uh, their, their cash balance has increased, I think like eight consecutive quarters or something and continuing to take chips off the table, uh, Warren Buffett's company. So yeah, I think that sell off in stocks as well, like a, a lot of people with the opinion that this earnings season for the major tech companies has been pretty weak. So their earnings have not quite met market expectations, which again, suggests that companies are sort of maybe become too overvalued um, and we would expect in a recession that you know a lot of the consumer behaviors and whatnot would, would change people not spending as much which would then eat into company performances and all of that um, another sort of big reason of course i for crypto specifically i think this is arguably the the most important reason why we've been selling off um, is just Trump, Donald Trump's election chances in men, in according to polls and according to different prediction markets, is is decreasing. Um, we've seen Kamala Harris, so the Democratic nominee, she has been her increasing her odds. So I guess really the election is now a flip of the coin, you could say. Whereas two weeks ago, uh, right after the Trump assassination, I think his odds of winning went up to about 70%, mm -hmm. but they're now come back significantly down to the low to mid 50s, again, according to Polymarket, which is just one one input. So why does that matter for crypto? Well, people associate Trump with being a lot more favorable for risk on assets like, like tech stocks and whatnot, and in particular crypto being a risk asset benefits from that. Um, whereas I guess Kamala is not Donald Trump in that sense. So you're seeing a correction there as well. Yeah, yeah, well said, Matt. And I think it's the narrowest lead Donald Trump's had since May. So a lot of people speculating whether the price of Bitcoin is pricing that in as is just the de facto prediction market now. And yeah, I think you know, that's probably a simplistic way to look at it. Um, I saw a couple other newsletters that were going around and showing that maybe the causation correlation you've got to remember isn't always one for one there. And these things can kind of just go in and out of, of correlations. So one to watch because no doubt that a Trump win would be widely beneficial for cryptocurrency. And I think Kamala Harris and Democrats are still uh, very, very quiet lipped on exactly what the attitude is going to be to cryptocurrency 
if any anything they're going to change that at all so one to watch and no doubt will have a huge impact on the market uh, maybe uh, the other big source of sell pressure here i've noticed matt was jump crypto which was a which is a, a subsidiary of jump trading they were reportedly moving millions of dollars worth of crypto from different wallets and onto exchanges notably selling a lot of eth on the open market now this sparked a lot of controversy because jump crypto trading that's their bread and butter they are a trading organization but it seemed to be happening uh, very last minute uh, very rapidly in the space of a night or a couple of days which i'm not sure how to what you make out of this matt whether they're four sellers in this situation or whether they're just trying to liquidate as fast as possible but very odd for a you know trip crypto trading firm to be so i guess reckless or instantaneous with the selling uh, and this has really contributed to eth uh dipping below that 30 percent in the last seven days yeah it was, it was quite odd to see the timing of that heavy heavy selling from jump crypto so yeah i guess there'll be you know on-chain data analysts and whatnot keeping track of their movements um but for now it seems to be over but it was very erratic and sort of out of nowhere so yeah we'll watch that of course and that's probably the only crypto specific reason for uh for this latest sell-off um and it was yeah worth worth pointing out for sure uh the final thing i noted too there matt was i'm not sure if you saw this after our pod with you know getting all excited about trump talking about not moving the bitcoin that the us has held that one percent figure we always talk about after that was released we had a us government department that's in charge of holding the you know seized us assets they moved the bitcoin to a new wallet to coinbase and this sparked a lot of controversy as well considering what we saw with germany earlier in the month or last month selling considerable amounts of Bitcoin. This stems, I think, a lot of concerns as well. So it's kind of come into a perfect storm, really, with all this news coming at once, and then more fears that perhaps the US government might start liquidating its Bitcoin if you know Trump does get in, and that could happen in the next couple of months. Um, I'm not sure what you make of it, but I just want to note that maybe it could be overblown because the US department did sign a new contract with Coinbase to make them their number one custodian for holding their cryptocurrency. That's something to keep in mind. And it's really difficult to ascertain exactly how much, if any, they've sold at the moment or whether they're just moving it to new custody with this new this new agreement. Yeah, I think that seems like a, a reasonable answer. I do believe like at the start of last year, they sort of forecasted or announced how much they plan to be selling in the next year or, or two. So I think the amounts are out there or at least maybe one agency's Bitcoin. Um, so again, it'll keep continuing to bob up um, with the Mt. Gox selling pressure as well, you know, continuing throughout August. Like there's a lot of factors at play here. And as we, again, I want to emphasize, there's always multiple reasons for any rise or, or decrease in, in any market, uh, particularly particularly crypto. And just finally, one that's, you know, worth, worth mentioning, uh, it is unfortunate, but it does sort of impact markets is just the in growing conflict in uh, in the Middle East. So worth, I think there are reports that things are sort of, you know, bubbling up and a potential uh, for a boil over after the assassination of the Hamas leader um, not too long ago. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that. Obviously, yeah, again, impacts markets, but not as not that's pretty un, not important compared to sort of the humanitarian side of things but people are attributing the market sell-off or partially for for this reason here of growing hostility uh yeah i think definitely matt and that's probably an underrated reason for the sell-off as well uh we have to remember that you know war is such a big volatile thing and it impacts certainty on global markets which mm. markets tend to crave that certainty so i think if we can summarize what's happened in the last you know, few days last week of the sell-off is that there's just been incredible uncertainty gripping the market from stock markets to war to even us you know moving bitcoin mm. this all contributes to to uncertainty jump crypto selling it's a lot of concern in the market and that's a core reason why and i even noted that australia upgraded their terrorism rating i think elevated a certain level so not only are us worried here but it's having impacts in a lot of countries around the world and 
even rumors that Iran could potentially have retaliation for what has happened to Israel. So these are potential escalations, which could only increase, you know, global uncertainty and, you know, markers don't like another big war or escalation to the war. So that's one that's kind of bubbling there under the surface. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, I think, yeah, that's that's a lot of reasons, but they're all important in, individually. And we'll, we'll keep you posted, you know, throughout uh, throughout well, the next week and by the next podcast. I know I just posted for Collective Shift members to really summarize where my head's at in terms of my own strategy, um, my outlook for the market. Uh, and I'll continue to update members if there is anything, you know, very, very pressing that happens during the week. But yeah, it's looking like a quite an eventful and volatile period ahead. So moving on to sort of some other, I guess, major developments from, from the past week. And we had you know, Tether, largest stablecoin issuer, um, putting in a really a record profit, Nick. You had this one? Yeah, they uh, revealed a 1.5 billion net profit. They, you know, in, in this filing or like this uh, declaration, they said that they had about 5 billion worth of excess, you know, I think reserves into their name and they hold about 80,000 Bitcoin. So the reason why this is so important is that Tether and USDT was one of the biggest overhangs in the industry the last four or five years, concerns around their insolvency, whether it was backed or not, there was a lot of concerns. Uh, this really, I think, silences a lot of the fears, uh, you know, they're becoming one of the most profitable, you know, companies in the world, pretty much. Mm. Uh, if you look at their, you know, uh, profitability per employee, very notorious chart that goes around crypto Twitter, you know, compared to a lot of the other banks, they're just far away the most profitable company, especially per employee. So, you know, you would have to really think Tether would have to really fumble the ball to be dangerous in not having appropriate reserves to back their stablecoin when redemptions come. And they've proved that they can settle the redemptions in some of the worst markets. So now they're setting records. You know, it's a really good good point for the market that can really gather a lot of confidence in USDT. Yeah, well said. And they'll sort of keep accumulating Bitcoin as well as, as that profit, of, like their profit numbers just continue. I think they're up, yeah, as you said, like up to around 80,000 BTC and that will just continue to go up for the foreseeable future, I think it's up to 15% of their net operating profits. They have the ability to sort of invest in into Bitcoin for the long term. So that's a nice sort of continued source of demand. But moving on to the SEC here, and they are sort of updated. There was a court update that came last week in relation to their case against Binance, where the SEC, it looks like they're planning to amend their, their initial sort of, I guess, lawsuit to drop the no longer make it so the judge has to make a decision about whether all of these alleged unregistered securities are in fact like i guess illegal or unregistered securities so that could be interpreted in a number of ways like why the sec is doing it i think the most bullish case that it's at one end of the spectrum is hey like they think it's a weak argument now on the most other side of the spectrum which i think I tend to be more on, on the side of is they're more just doing it for strategic purposes. Like we no longer, if I'm the SEC, like we no longer have to prove or we no longer have to have this as an argument that's relevant to this case. Um, I think it's still in the Coinbase SEC case. It's still in the SEC versus Kraken law ca lawsuit as far as I'm concerned. Um, and again, I think people got really excited by the headline, um, but it doesn't seem to be um you know proving to be that much of a driver of prices mm -hmm. at the moment but we'll keep an eye on it for sure and of course those lawsuits continue to go on and we're still awaiting the sec versus uniswap labs uh lawsuit as we know that we saw that you know initial notice that wells notice that they could be starting to press charges on them but we still haven't seen that in about three four or five months time okay moving on to micro strategy here nick uh, so micro strategy again in the headlines uh, they've come out and rolled out like this new Bitcoin yield play that they're trying to term. Uh, essentially, this is just kind of using a lot of the debt and issuance of the stock in what they're already currently doing. In a way, it's kind of like leverage Bitcoin because they keep issuing debt then and selling off some of their company stock and then buying the proceeds, uh, Bitcoin with the proceeds. And they're kind of calling this a yield and they're trying to put the difference into a number. Uh, so they're kind of committed to a certain amount of yield that they want to bring forward. And this is you know, kind of interesting, especially as we now have the Bitcoin ETFs. They kind of got to differentiate themselves in a way. Uh, they've also announced a $2 billion 
plan to buy more Bitcoin with more company debt and more issuance of the stock. So we're going to see more more Bitcoin buying from MicroStrategy and Sailor, Matt. Uh, one day when this is going to end, really, because I think it looks like the Bitcoin standard that they're pursuing is just going to keep on going. Yeah, I think that two billion equates to yeah, I think it was in in the thirty thousands, uh, depending on the price USD. So. You know, I think they're on about 225,000 Bitcoin that they hold at the moment. So before long, that could creep up to 250,000 Bitcoin that, that one entity is holding. Uh, yeah, and when you divide that as a, oh, as a percentage of 21 million, that's, um, yeah, quite substantial for sure. Uh, onto the altcoin market, as always, every week there's, you know, dozens of altcoin updates. We like to really just emphasize the ones we think are the most important for you to, to understand or to be aware of. Uh, Nick, you'll kick things off this week with, with Avalanche. Yeah, Avalanche was in the news for a very big partnership with the California DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles. They said that they claimed that they're going to help put 42 million car titles on chain using the Avalanche blockchain. So huge one here. Car titles has always been one of those ones that have been talked about as being a real use case for crypto. And so essentially, you're going to be able to use I think an app with the California DMV to claim and to change it. And then on the back end, that will change on the state on the Avalanche blockchain. So all backed by Avalanche, a really big coup here, uh, especially Avalanche really kind of fell out of favor in the last few months and last you know two years for really being unable to catch Ethereum and Solana and a lot of these other emerging blockchains. They've been sitting there uh, kind of struggling and this is a big uh, use case and a wonder if we'll see more of these potential partnerships with Avalanche. Yeah, one to keep an eye on for sure. With Lido here, they had an update last week introducing an institutional offering called Lido Institutional. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's just a push. We've seen uh, other DeFi projects push into institutions in the past, Compound famously and, and also Aave both launched and then wound down institutional offerings but now lido is the latest DeFi project to to have a go at that obviously they're different in the sense from compound and, and Aave that they're not sort of money markets or lending protocols but they are still ultimately a, a DeFi project and we'll see if there's any traction here among institutions getting exposure to maybe st eth instead of potentially holding eth passively or or even you know, getting involved in the technical complexities of spinning up your own nodes and managing all that. Um, and they don't want to maybe go with a centralized lending uh, staking provider. So yeah, we'll see if there's any traction here from Lido, who continues to be the dominant liquid staking provider uh, in the market by, by quite some margin. Uh, is there anything in the market uh, maybe listeners should be paying attention to, Matt? Uh, the only thing I have really is looking at the forward cut, the forward prediction markets for rates. I think they're pricing in uh, 50 or a 0.5 percent increase uh, to the tune of 50 basis points, uh, and that's really increased considerably over the last few days with the weakness in the economy. So that's one in September to really pay attention to. Uh, anything on your side, Matt? No, nah, that's definitely yeah the biggest. I think Sam, uh, the Federal Reserve. Unfortunately, this is. August, I think they do 10 meetings a year and August is one of them that they have off um, where they have their Jackson Hole sort of symposium uh, every year. So that is going to be a very uh, big event now with commentary from mm. central bankers who fly into the US once a year. Uh, yeah, it'll be yeah, very eventful and we'll see some, some press conferences and whatnot from all the important sort of Federal Reserve Board members and whatnot, but we won't actually have a meeting in August. So whenever you see predictions of a 50 basis point move in either direction, it signals that the market is quite stressed. Um, so that again, even though it's technically a rate cut, which is what people were hoping for, uh, the fact that it's now actually, you know, to the ex more extreme side of 50 basis point, it, it, again, sort of illustrates just how uncertain the market currently is. But getting into sort of our underrated and over appreciated or overrated sort of news items from the past week, there's plenty of candidates now because of just how you know, much the focus, of course, understandably, was was on the price action over the past three days. Uh, there were some things that really did sneak through uh, and go off a lot of people's or missed a lot of people's radars. So I'll kick things off this week with the Morgan Stanley news that we sort of spoke about 
a few months ago, the news at the time was that there were reports that Morgan Stanley, so one of the biggest you know, banks in the, in the world, was getting ready to let their private wealth advisors start, I suppose, advising and, and recommending uh, the Bitcoin ETFs that launched in January. Uh, we've talked about you know why this is such a big deal at the moment. You know the ETFs, uh, the accessibility to them is quite uh, is not as as great as what many people would expect. Uh, whereas a lot of the ETF buyers are actually quite, I suppose, sophisticated relatively speaking. Because it's, if I want to buy an ETF at the moment, as someone who's a client of these wealth advisors, I actually have to come to them and and suggest that I hey I found this thing doing my own research can I go ahead and buy this CTF? Whereas at the moment, the, the advisors cannot really say anything without me coming to them, which is again, quite unique, but it's a typical process of having something that's very new. So now we've got this news, as we can see here, Haseeb, one of the well-known venture capitalists uh, in the space saying that this is a huge event because last week, I think there was some more confirmation that they actually have been given the go-ahead. So Morgan Stanley has given their private wealth advisors the go-ahead to start recommending the Bitcoin ETFs to their clients. So one of the biggest stories of this of this year is I think the market under under appreciating how limited the access is to these ETFs and they will continue to get bigger at the rest of 2024 and even 2025, it'll continue mm -hmm. to increase. Yeah, I know I talked about that one in the, in the recent newsletter when we were diving into the ETH. ETF flows, and that was a big uh, takeaway from I think the BlackRock guys. Uh, they said that hey, you know these aren't going to be rolled out, uh, you know at the you know very quickly at the moment. So we have to wait until 2025 to understand the full effects and offerings of these products. So huge one there, Matt, and hopefully we see formal confirmation in the coming weeks. Uh, my over or underappreciated was an underappreciated for stablecoins. Uh, not many people would actually know if you head to the Visa dashboard for stablecoin supply. If we don't include crypto native stable coins and the Terra USD stable coin, which attributed to I think about 18 billion worth of value at its peak, uh, crypto stable coins actually would have probably hit or been at around an all time high. Uh, these centralized products from USDC, USDT, PayPal's PayYUSD and Paxos USDP, they total about 145 billion heading to 150 billion. The total crypto market cap is of stablecoins is about 180, uh, and it's probably sitting at about I think 160 if you take into account, you know, uh, decentralized cryptocurrency stablecoins. So this is one that I'm looking at that says, hey, maybe stablecoins have actually hit an all-time high if we take away Terra's USD stablecoin. So one to watch, and I think stablecoin supply is probably going to be the biggest uh, metric to watch, especially in this latest sell-off. You know how much of the stablecoin left the ecosystem compared to how much stayed. That's going to be a huge telling of confidence in the space in this latest sell-off. Yeah, well said, Nick. We want one to watch, and as we enter, yeah, an eventful week. It definitely there'll be a lot to talk about. I'm sure in the next podcast. But before then, if you did want access to more of our insights, definitely start with our free weekly market newsletter. So that drops every Friday. You can subscribe to that at collectiveshift.io/newsletter. That's collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter.